Today, I have entitled my message as Many are called, few are chosen. I'm sure all of you have read the soul, right? And the last verse of the soul is actually saying, For many are called, but few are chosen. So let us go straight to our soul. The title is taken from Matthew chapter 22, verse 14, where it says, For many are called, but few are chosen. So taken from Matthew chapter 22, verse 1 to 14, the parable of the wedding feast. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servant to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out the other servant, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fat cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servant, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to his servant, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found. Pay attention to this. It says, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servant, Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. My sermon title is, Many are called, few are chosen. When we see this story, those who were invited, they did not come. They did not come. Some of them are unwilling. Some of them are too busy. Some of them came, but without the wedding garment. But who were invited? Who were invited? All of them were invited. You know, the gospel was first preached to the Jews. They were initially the first one to be invited. But because they rejected, it was given to the Gentile. And we are the Gentile today. We are the one in the highway. They said, all those who are in the highway, whoever they are, bad or good, invite them. And we are those people. So today, my first point is invitation. The invitation. You know, Christmas is coming. Sometimes we invite people to our house, you know, we have this Christmas gathering, there is an invitation sent to you. Right? There is an invitation sent to you. So, who is invited to this wedding? The wedding of the son of the king. Everyone. Jesus said this. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 5, verse 31 to 32. Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So this is the story where Jesus called Levi or Matthew, I forgot, who is the tax collector. And he was eating with him. And the people come around him and say, how can you eat with sinner? And this is what Jesus said. He did not come to save the righteous. He came to save 
the sinner. Call them to repentance. So who were called? The sinners. And who are the sinners? Every one of us are sinners. Which means all are called. All of us are called because Jesus said he did not come to call the righteous. He came to call the sinners for repentance. And we are called today. How I know? Because everyone is a sinner. I am a sinner. You are a sinner. Everyone is a sinner. And all is called. Let us see this in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. It says, Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. If all sin, which means all is called, because Jesus come to call the sinner, right? So Jesus come to call the sinner, and everyone is a sinner, which means everyone is called. David rec recognized this. I think I shared this verse again and again previously, even throughout this year. He said this, Psalms 51 verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. In Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In Mark chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, it says, For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thought, adulteries, fornication, murders, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So all these verses, I can even show you many more verses who talk about how wicked and sinful men are. There are so many Bible verses that talk about human heart apart from God. Apart from God, all of us are sinners. All of us are supplanter. All of us are cheater. All of us are liars. Apart from God, there is no righteousness in us. That's why we need the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is found in Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. At the age of 30, when Jesus went to that Jordan River, He took your sin and my sin, all of our sin, at that River Jordan, when John the Baptist laid His hand. And He willingly walked for three years for you and I, died on that cross to pay for the penalty of our sin, rose again to give us a new life today. It's in Him that we can become righteous. Apart from Him, we are all sinners. Apart from Him, we are all unrighteous. Amen? You know, one day I come across a verse in the Bible which, which make me confused. Like, is God actually uh, unjust? Is God unfair? That He call certain people? He don't call certain people? He chose certain people and not chose certain people. How can it be like many are called, few are chosen? What if I'm born? God knows everything what? I'm born and then I'm already fated, they say. Fated to be not chosen by God. Anyways, God does not choose me. So why do I need to believe in Him? God is unfair. You know, when I read this verse a long time ago, before I was born again, I was confused. But today, I know that all of us are called because all of us are sinners. Let us see what verse is this. Taken from Romans chapter 9, verse 9 to 13. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, will I return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only that, but this too. Rebecca conceived two sons under exactly the same circumstances by our forefather Isaac and the children were yet unborn and had so far done nothing either good or evil even so in order further to carry out God's purpose of selection election choice which depend not on works or what man can do but on him who calls them, it was said 
to her that the elder son should serve the younger son. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Held in relative disregard in comparison with my feeling to Jacob. Wow. It says that when Rebecca was having the baby, the twins' baby in her womb, Jacob and Esau, God already told them that I will love Jacob, I will hate Esau. Even before they are born. What if today, before I'm born, God already say, I will love Reina, I will hate Ern. How would I feel? I will say that, wow, this God is unjust. This God is unfair. This God is not loving. How can he say he loved someone and hate someone even before they are born? What is God teaching in this story? God is actually teaching us there are two kinds of people. There are two kinds of people. One is like Jacob. They will say that, God, I'm a supplanter, I'm a cheater, I'm a liar. I cannot help. I cannot save myself. You save me. There is another group of people like Esau, so strong in his flesh, self-righteous. And God hated that kind of person. It's not that God is unfair. God is actually teaching us a principle that we are selected within the righteousness of God. We are elected within the righteousness of God. Apart from Christ, we are all wicked. Apart from Christ, we are all unrighteous. Please remember this. Don't try to be righteous by yourself. You will fail. When you fail, you will feel discouraged. When you feel discouraged, you will even draw away from God because you think that you couldn't achieve His standard. Remember, when we first come back to Abide, I show you all a picture that said the standard is too high. Yes, the standard is too high. Because the righteousness of God cannot be attained by our own work. That's why we need to unite into Christ, die with Him, die to our own nature, die to ourselves, and rose again with Him so that we can live in that new life. It's in that new life we can praise Him. It's in that new life we can glorify Him. Apart from Him, we cannot do anything. God is not unjust. You know, the verse will continue. It says, Is God unjust? Is there injustice in God? Certainly not, Paul will say. Can the, you know, the clay, the potter can shape us to whatever shape that he wants because he is the one that created us. He is the one that formed us. He is the one that called us. He can shape us to be whatever form that he wants. Can the clay say, Potter, Potter, why are you making me to be this? I want to be that. I want to be this. I want to be the chair. I want to be this. We cannot choose what we want. God called us at different stage, different life. Some of us are born again at different age. God called us at different station of life. And we are going to use that, whatever age, whatever talent, whatever that we have to glorify Him. And God is very very um, fair. And the Bible also says that He desire that all men will come to know this truth. His desire is for all men to be safe. Let us read this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 to 4. It says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desire all men to be safe and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, how can we say that God is not loving? How can we say that God loves certain people and hates certain people that, before they are born? God is actually teaching us a principle that if we don't humble ourselves, come before God like Jacob, He don't like that kind of person. He don't like a self-righteous person. He don't like those people who have attitude like the Pharisee. He don't like. 
But when you can humble yourself, acknowledge who you are, God, I'm such a sinner. I have nothing good in me. Apart from you, I will burn in hell. If you realize that, that's the first point. If you realize that, you can be saved. And God is calling. Calling who? The self-righteous? No, He's calling the sinner. And all of us were the sinner. And today, we have been made righteous in His sight through Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. And that's the whole reason why we celebrated Christmas. That's the whole reason why Jesus was born on that Christmas day. Why do we celebrate Christmas? To celebrate the birth of Jesus, right? So what is the name Jesus mean? What does Jesus mean? In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, the angel says this, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sin. So Jesus basically means the Savior who will save his people from their sin. Jesus come not only for the righteous, not only for a certain group of people. Jesus come to save all men. That's why when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, the next day he said, there the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world. Sins of the world. From the first man to the last man. From this generation, next generation, previous generation, Adam's generation, Noah's generation, Abraham's generation, all the sin of the world has been passed upon the body of Jesus when John the Baptist laid his hand. It's not just this generation. Today I'm born. Today I know this person, that person. Not only this group of people, but all the whole world's sin has been passed upon the body of Jesus until the last man. That's why the Bible even says that God saved us even before we were born. Christ was slain even before the foundation of the world. So how can we say that God don't love us? God loved us so much that He sent His Son so that He can die for us, so that He can rise up again to give us a new life. Now this invitation is given to all people. It's given to everybody because everybody is a sinner. But how do we respond to the invitation? From today's soul, I glimpsed three groups of people. Three groups of people that respond very differently to the invitation that the king gives. You know, if a king asks you to come to the palace, will you wear a slipper? Will you wear a t-shirt? And just, here king, I'm here. Of course, you will wear the best suit that you have. You will, you will be so prepared, right? If we do that to human king, what more? The king of the universe. So these three group of people, let us see. The first one is those group of people who are unwilling. And then the second one is those people who are too busy. And the third one is the one that is unprepared. You know the fact that we are here today, which means we are willing. We are not the first group. We are willing. We are not too busy either. But what I'm afraid of is we can be not prepared. Let us read the soul again to understand better. Let us read. The parable of the wedding feast. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servant to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were, pay attention to this, not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fat cattle are killed. And all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made 
light of it and went their way. Pay attention to this. One to his own farm and another to his business. And the rest seized his servant, treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious and sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to his servant, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servant, Bind him, hand and foot. Take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So from here, the highlighted one that you read just now is the characteristic of these people. Some are not willing, invited you, preached the gospel to you, still refuse, still refuse, still refuse, don't want to listen, unwilling. Some go to this farm, go to do this business, I'm too busy, I don't have time for church. I don't have time for Jesus. Too busy. And actually, the dangerous one is actually those who are there in the wedding, but not prepared. My second point is preparation. Preparation. What is that wedding garment? The garment is the garment of righteousness, the gospel of God's righteousness. You know, when we are invited to a wedding or we are invited to an event or we are invited to Christmas party, we will prepare ourselves, right? We prepare ourselves, we prepare some gift, we will dress nicely. You know, the difference is this. The difference is this. When we have that kind of invitation, we know. We know when it will happen. Next week, we have a Christmas celebration. We know that we're going to prepare for next week. But the difference with this wedding is we don't know when it will happen. If you remember, there is another parable that Jesus spoke about. The parable of the five foolish virgins and five wise virgin. Five of them have lamb, have oil, enough oil for that lamb. But another five do not have. Oil here speaks about the Holy Spirit. Today, God is inviting all of us to know the gospel correctly, to really be founded in the gospel have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in you today. Because if you can see in this parable, the bridegroom came in at an unexpected time. They don't know that tomorrow will be the day that the bridegroom will come. We need to be prepared. We need to have the gospel of God's righteousness intact in us. Today. Why? Because we don't know when we will meet Him. If I know that Jesus will come next week, I can prepare myself towards next week. But I do not know. If I know that tomorrow I will die, one week before, I will get saved. I will come to know the gospel. Because I know that oh, tomorrow I'm going to die. We do not know when we will die. We do not know when Jesus will come. And that's why we need to be prepared all the time. Without being prepared all the time, we will end up 
like this guy just now, the last guy. Let us read one more time. When the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in without a wedding garment? And what was his reaction? He was speechless. Then the king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called but few are chosen. On that day, when we meet him face to face, we have no excuse to him. What we will do is, like this guy, we will be speechless. The preparation has to be done today. The preparation has to be done before we meet him. You know, if I know Christmas, I know some of you haven't buy your present. You know, I know oh, next week I still got time. I still got time. I can even buy one day before. But for this, we cannot. For this salvation, we cannot. Because we don't know. We don't know when it will happen. We don't know when we will die. We, will, we don't know when we will meet him face to face. And we need to be prepared today. Have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, Be holy, for I am holy. How to be holy? We cannot be holy, church. We cannot be holy. Let us read this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 to 16. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desire you had when you live in ignorance. But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. How to be holy? We cannot be holy. Earn, just now you say that we are all born as a sinner. Yes, you are born as a sinner. And the fact is, you cannot change that. The only way to change that is to unite with Jesus in His baptism. When you unite with Him, when you died with Him, your old flesh died. It's no longer you who live, but Christ lives in you. When He rose again, He gave you the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Remember? The virgin story that I told you just now, the Holy Spirit, the oil, the Holy Spirit is given to you freely, not because of your work. Last week I shared, the last verse, last week I shared, the call. God called us to live a holy life. Let us see. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of His own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Before the beginning of time. He has saved us and called us to live a holy life. But we cannot. It's only when we walk in the Spirit we can live that holy life. If we keep on walking in our flesh, try walking holy. We cannot. We will just be a hypocrite because we know that we fail God all the time. Apart from the Spirit, we are all dead. It's only in the Spirit we can glorify Him. It's in the Spirit we can live a holy life. It's in the Spirit. That's why to get your Spirit alive is so important. If your Spirit is not alive, how can you live in the Spirit? In the first place, your Spirit is not alive. But if your Spirit is alive, you can live in the Spirit. You can walk in the Spirit. Amen? And Paul said this, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling you have received. And in the New Living Translation, he said this, Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you. Paul is begging them to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. We are called by God today to live a holy life. And the fact is, we cannot live that holy life. It's only in Christ. It's only when we are walking in the Spirit 
That's why getting yourself born again is so important. Getting founded in the gospel is so important. Being prepared right now is so important. Amen? And all of us are called in different stations of life, as I mentioned just now. Let us read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17 to 24. Live as you are called. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandment of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slave of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. So Paul is saying that if you are called when you are circumcised, don't try to be uncircumcised. When you are called when you are uncircumcised, don't try to be circumcised. When you are called you are slave, don't try to be the boss. Live as you are called, whatever state. If you are called as a student, live in that calling as a student. If you are called at a state where you are a working class, live your calling in that life, in that working environment. Live, the last verse it says, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Don't try to be somebody else. Don't try to be hero. Be who you are. Be transparent to God. God, this is who I am. Use me. Use me. Don't try to be someone else. You know, I read a quote last time. It's about egg. It says, if an egg is broken from the inside, life is formed. But if an egg is broken from the outside, Life is destroyed. Do you understand? If we are trying so hard from the outside to change ourselves, we can never do that. Change comes from within. Change comes from within. That is the one that gives us life. Just like the egg. You know, chicken, when it hatch from the inside, right? The power that break that egg is from the inside. Life is formed. But if you try and knock from the outside, the force from outside, it will be broken. So don't try to be someone else. Don't try to, to of course you can aspire to be, oh, I want to be a good guitarist like Brother Benji. I want to be a good drummer like Brother Joshua. You can aspire to be that, but don't try to be someone else. Come as who you are. Because the power that changed you it's not from yourself. It's from God. God is the one that empowers you to live that calling that He has called you. Let us read this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, his divine power has given us enough for us to live the life that He wants us to live. The holy life. It says, of Him who called us by glory and virtue. He is the one who called us. He is the one that will empower us. Don't try with your flesh. You will fail. When you fail, you will feel discouraged. That's why don't try. Walk in the Spirit. And God, I don't know. I don't know what you want me to do, but I avail myself. I'm available. Use me. Use me. 
and God will use you because you avail yourself to be used by Him. Amen? And another verse in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11 to 12, it also says this, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God, you see, who is the one that makes us walk worthy of His calling? Our God. That our God may make you worthy of His calling. And that by His power, is by His power, He may bring to friction your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It says that our God is the one that will make you worthy of His calling and by His power. And the last sentence there, it says, prompted by faith. It's by faith we walk this journey. It's by faith we live worthy of His calling. By sight cannot. By flesh cannot. It's by faith. By faith in the righteousness of God. Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection. Recognize and realize that you have died to your old life. The life that you have is the life in Christ. When you know that that is the only life you have, you will walk worthy of Him because you don't want to live in your filthiness. You don't want to live in the life that is so bad. All of us are born as a sinner, right? I think that is a very good thing. If we are born as a righteous person, then we have something to boast about. We have something to bring before God and say, see, I'm so good. But because we are born as a sinner, we have nothing to boast. We receive it by grace through faith. You know, I just imagine the if you all have um, in your house, have you experienced not washing your dishes for a few days? And then there will be a lot of things, leftover food in that sink. Imagine putting all those water with that leftover food inside of a jar. You know, when you put it inside the jar, you leave it for a few days, right? All the dirt, all the leftover food will, will be below. Will be below. Because it's heavy, right? It will be below. But the moment you stir that jar, you can see all the filthiness come out. That is our life. Sometimes we just surpass ourselves and, okay, I'm not going to sin today. I'm going to be a good boy. I'm going to be a good girl today. But the moment someone steps on your feet, all those things come out. All those things that sinking below, when no one stir you, wow, you look so clean. But the moment someone stir you, that is the moment everything come out. The smelly noodle, the smelly fish, all come out. All the smell comes out. That is how our life is. So don't try to be righteous by yourself. It's only in Christ. In Christ we can. Amen? And my last verse is taken from Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. It says, For you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh and an opportunity or excuse for selfishness. But through love, you should serve one another. So we are called to freedom. Now I'm sinless and righteous. There is no more sin in me. Don't make use of this as an opportunity for your flesh to sin. Anyways, I'm sinless and righteous. I can do what I want. No. God called us to live a holy life. And it's in that holy life, we know that we can see God, we can experience God. Amen? It's in that we can glorify God. Then we can say, my life for His glory. If we are not walking in the Spirit, we can never glorify God. It's only in the Spirit. Amen? Amen? With that, I've ended my message.